Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. We begin in Thunder Bay tonight where the troubled police service is facing a new human rights complaint, which cites racism in the force and the health care system. APTN's Leanne Sanders has that story. John Semmerling filed the complaint with the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal on January 13th, 2023. It names the acting chief, Dan Taddeo, a sergeant and three constables. Summerling is seeking financial compensation of $300,000 for employment losses as he's been scared to leave the house. The complaint alleges that Semmerling was forcibly taken from his home by police after a friend called for a wellness check. Summerling had lost his job and the friend became concerned for him, according to the complaint. Lawyer Chantal Bryson says Semmerling initially agreed to go to the health centre, but after waiting to see a doctor without success and seeing no sign of the officers, he started walking home. All of a sudden, um, I believe it was three cruisers race up, um, four officers, none of which knew, identified themselves, and one of them uh, grabbed him and punched him in the face four times. They broke his nose and they severely injured. He had facial injuries even two weeks later when he came to see me. Like he was visibly bruised, he had concussion symptoms. He now has um, serious fear of, and anxiety of even leaving the house, of possible interactions with the police. The official complaint lays out how the incident has affected Semmerling. Mr. Semmerling was an outgoing Indigenous community leader and deacon in the Roman Catholic Church. He has suffered physical and mental trauma as a result of the actions of the respondents and now fears leaving his home and is easily triggered by the mere sight of the Thunder Bay Police Services officers or the Thunder Bay Health Sciences Centre. In response to APTN's request for a comment, a spokesperson for the service said in an emailed statement, we have not seen the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario application that you are referring to and therefore would not be able to provide comment. The complaint also names Dr. David Yee and the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre for allegedly restraining Semmerling when he was brought back to the centre. A statement emailed to APTN says, Due to privacy laws, we are unable to speak publicly on issues related to our patients, staff, physicians, or volunteers. What we can say is the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Centre is committed to providing safe, quality, and respectful care to all the diverse populations we serve. Bryson says Semmerling eventually met with a social worker and was released. She says they're willing to have the matter resolved through mediation, as it could be years before the complaint makes it to a hearing due to what she calls a crisis in Ontario's tribunal system. Leanne Sanders, APTN National News, Winnipeg. To Ottawa now, where the Trudeau government announced a new modern treaty implementation policy on Tuesday. Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Mark Miller made the announcement alongside representatives from Nunavut, Tungavik and the Nishka Nation. The policy includes regular meetings between the Prime Minister and leaders whose nations have modern treaties and an oversight body to solve disputes before they go to court. It will be co-developed over the next six months. Here's what Miller had to say about the new policy. We recognize that standing up and making uh, principled statements sometimes is difficult oftentimes it's easy uh, but you can't walk away from them and you need people to put teeth to them and i think that's what we're talking about today moving from principle to actual on the ground policy and the implementation of that policy indigenous youth in northern ontario will soon have access to health professions training in their communities it's a new initiative aimed at addressing health care accessibility in the remote north the details of the new health professions program were announced earlier today. It's a partnership between Winnebago Area Health Authority, or WAHA, Queen's University, and the MasterCard Foundation, which is committing $31 million to support the project. Winnebago and Queen's Health Sciences will co-develop the program in the Western James Bay region. Lynn Innes, Innes, the uh, CEO of Winnebago, says it will help fill the gaps in providing health care in Northern Ontario.
I know that it's not going to be ready for a few years yet, but we, we are struggling uh, it, with HHR, so a health human resource issue uh, currently. Uh, so we're looking at innovative ways to be able to bring education to the region, uh, to be able to grow our own people, to be able to sustain our health care system for future generations. To the Yukon now, where women involved in the justice system have never had a transition house to help them get back into society. That's about to change thanks to a new pilot program that will be the first of its kind in the north. Jordan Hasselbeck has that story. And so this is what a typical room would look like. We are in the process of um, just fitting up some of the final details like blackout blinds and things like that that will be necessary for summer. Um, this is one of the six bedrooms in the newly renovated building that will serve as a halfway house for women in the Yukon. The Takini Haven building is on Whitehorse Correctional Facility grounds and in the past has been a resource center for men. Now, a new two-year pilot project run by nonprofit organization Connective will see the building become a living space and resource center for women involved in the justice system. Here in the territory, supports and services for justice involved men have existed in some form or another for over 30 years, but equivalent services for women have been very limited over the years. Until now, there hasn't been a women's halfway house in Northern Canada. Yukon Justice Minister Tracy Ann McPhee says the project will offer gender responsive, culturally sensitive programs for women who are on bail, have conditional sentences, or are in the process of reintegrating back into their communities. This programming will allow women who might otherwise be unsafe returning to their community, uh, who are involved in a justice uh, process, to be in a safe place and to start to address some of their concerns and issues. Along with the six bedrooms, the facility includes two bathrooms, a shared living room, kitchen and dining area. The building will be staffed and monitored 24-7. Again, it's meant to be a home-like environment for anybody living here. Um, so Connective's Assistant Regional Director Gigi McKee says the cultural programming will be tailored to each individual with help from the Council of Yukon First Nations. Sometimes it'll be um, on the land uh, facilitation, sometimes it'll be um, mitten making, um, it could be beading, it could be talking circles, it could be fire. Um, it, it's a variety of, of uh, supports that the, the residents themselves would like to see and that can shift and change. McKee says they're still in the process of hiring staff and hope to be able to open towards the end of March. Jordan Hasselbeck, APTN National News, Whitehorse. The family of a woman who died after an assault in Opaipon and Ipiwan Cree Nation says she was loved. They say her death was has highlighted the need for more resources in the community. APTN Sav Jones has more. 47-year-old Noreen Tate died at a Winnipeg hospital after being airlifted from the nation also known as South Indian Lake after she was assaulted on February 19th. Emotions ran high as her family spoke at a recent news conference. Arla Tate says her sister's death has impacted everyone in the community, and this is just the latest blow. There have been an increase in critical incidents of violence resulting in homicides and an alarming increase of domestic violence incidents. OPCN citizens are experiencing mental health crises addictions, homelessness, food insecurity, in inadequate health care, and a lack of access to safe drinking water. The RCMP, along with major crime services and forensic identification services, are investigating Tate's death, but no arrest has been made. Chief Shirley Ducharme says to ease the grief, justice is needed. She also called for more resources in the remote fly-in nation, saying satellite services are not enough. All these issues, problems stem from alcohol and drugs. Our community needs to heal in a healthy way. Sab Jones, APTN National News, Winnipeg. A man is in serious but stable condition after a stabbing on Sunday at the 2023 International Peace Pow Wow and Festival in Lethbridge, Alberta. Lethbridge police say two men have been charged and are in custody. 
Both 22 years old, Dylan Jeremy Braverock and Dalton Mark Oldshoes face multiple charges for the assault, including assault with a weapon. Police say the parties are known to each other and it was not a random incident. Our Atlantic Canada reporter Angel Moore is cur currently in Fredericton, New Brunswick, working on a story she'll have soon about a partnership between First Nations and a forestry company. Here she is now with a preview. I'm here at the Fredericton Convention Centre where the Wallisticwe Nation announced a memorandum of understanding with a foreign-based forestry company, the AV Group of New Brunswick. Its parent company is based in India. The agreement is for forest co-management and economic opportunities. But most notably today, the government of New Brunswick was not present and not involved in the MOU. I'll have more details on this story soon. Welcome back. Federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh was in Winnipeg today. He's calling for federal funding to go towards solving health worker shortages. Singh stopped by APTN HQ earlier in the day. Mr. Singh, you're in Winnipeg in part talking uh, about health care. Indigenous peoples already lag behind in terms of quality health outcomes. How would the Liberals propose health care changes uh, adversely affect Indigenous peoples? Well, we know that when our healthcare system is not where it needs to be, it is the most vulnerable people that will feel the, the repercussions of that. So if our healthcare system is failing, it's going to fail the people who need it most. And that means uh, racialized people, indigenous people, people who are already marginalized. 
and the current agreement or the current negotiated deal that the Prime Minister has with the province of Manitoba doesn't include any strings attached or any conditions that would actually solve the healthcare crisis. The major problem we have is a shortage of healthcare workers. That's nurses, doctors, support workers. And the fact that no conditions were imposed to require the province, the province of Manitoba in this case, to actually solve the problem by spending that money on hiring frontline healthcare workers means the gaps that already exist for Indigenous community members in terms of accessing healthcare will only get worse. In recent weeks, there's been some tragic house fires in First Nations that uh, some of your MPs have spoken about, most recently in Pekanjikam, but also in, in Wienesk. Uh, what, if anything, at the federal level would you do about the lack of fire standards on First Nations? We need to immediately respond with, with having the proper supports in place for fire prevention and fire protection services. Uh, people need to be able to live in their homes with the security of knowing that if anything ever goes wrong, they can access services. And just because someone lives in a rural or remote community, lives on an indigenous uh, reserve, that that doesn't mean they have any less right to making sure they live in a safe and secure place. And so we need to invest in proper housing that can keep people safe, but also make sure that, that fire services are available so that communities are safe. And so far, it's been woefully inadequate. People do not have the safety and security that they deserve, particularly Indigenous communities living in, in reserves and in more remote and rural communities. That has to change, and, and we would immediately, I would, as Prime Minister, immediately fix that. Uh, you bring up housing, and the NDP recently brought up the problems with housing in question period uh, right before the House went on break. Uh, a week ago, an Indigenous Housing Association based in BC asked for $6 billion in the next federal budget uh, as a fix for the problem. Do you see that as, as being a solution? Well, one of the things that we really know uh, is, is a major problem is there's a lot of fancy announcements. That, that say that you can access this money to build more housing. And then when Indigenous communities try to access it, it's not there, it's unaccessible. The criteria is too lengthy, too hard to actually use, and none of the money actually flows to where it's needed. So we pushed the government to develop a for Indigenous, by Indigenous housing fund. And it's really the way the funds are delivered. They have to be accessible. It's got to be straightforward. It has to work for the needs of Indigenous communities. And, and that's something that we've seen so far has not been there. Uh, many chiefs have complained about trying to get a project up and running and saying they've got the project, they, they know what they want to build, but there's no fund that they can actually access. I want to change that. I want to make sure that programs that we offer are actually accessible to the people who need it. And that seems to me like a starting point, but that's something that we're, we're fighting for and something that we've included in our agreement. And we're seeing some steps forward on this for Indigenous by Indigenous strategy, which would really be tailored to the community's needs and respond to them. You know, we look at uh, housing, health care, fire safety, water, uh, you know, your party is has a deal with the Liberal Party to, to keep them in power. But this is a party that seems to continue to disappoint Indigenous peoples in this country. Are you willing to continue that support to, of the Liberals given their track record? Well, what we're doing is using our power to deliver on things like the for Indigenous, by Indigenous housing with funding and a plan that actually gets money to communities to build homes. We deliver with dental care for folks that did not have dental care coverage. We sent out a GST rebate of almost $467 for over 10 million Canadians, doubling the GST rebate. So we've been able to send real supports to people and want to use our agreement to leverage it to get more help to people. And that means help with health care, with housing, and we'll continue to do that. We always have the option of withdrawing our support and we will always consider that as an option. And we will make that decision whether we do so or not in terms of what is in the best interest of Canadians, and if we are no longer able to force this government to deliver for people, then we'll make that, make that choice. Just lastly here, uh, the move to ban TikTok on government de devices. You're the most followed Canadian member of Parliament on the popular social media app. What do you make of the ban, and, and do you feel like it might hurt your ability to get the message out? Well, on a personal note, I'm not concerned about it at all. I want to be able to reach out to people wherever they are, whether it's in a community centre or on a social media platform. But when uh, serious concerns are raised around privacy and security, particularly not just of myself, but of of people interacting with me on that platform, I, I'm uh, more than uh, 
content to to take a pause from uh, the platform. That's what I'm what I'm doing, and assessing if there's a way to engage in a way that will uh, be safe for Canadians, for, for myself, but also for people that want to engage with me on that platform. So we'll wait to hear about that. And we're going to follow the House of Commons rules now that ban it on federal devices. And that's something that myself and my team will be doing. Mr. Singh, we'll have to leave it there, but uh, appreciate you making some time to pop by AP10 HQ today. Thanks so much. An honor to be on the show. Time now for another quick break. But first, a look at another story we have in the coming days for you. Coming soon. I'll have a story of Niska communities celebrating Hobie over the weekend in Lacozac. Niska culture dancers led the way in the grand entry into the community center. The celebration was a powerful display of culture, language, and song. Hobie actually originated in the, the village of Gitwinsilk back in the 90s as an actual event to celebrate uh, the upcoming moon, the harvest harvesting season and as a way to express ourselves culturally. This story coming soon on AP10 National News. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. And our very own Brent McGilvery was up late last night and was able to capture this incredible shot from his own patio of the Northern Lights as seen from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. You can email your photos to share at aptn.ca for the chance to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, zero with snow in Halifax, minus two in Charlottetown. Sunny and 13 below for Kujuac, minus 19 in Nain, plus two in Montreal, minus two for Val d'Or. Plus one with snow in Sault Ste. Marie, three above in North Bay. Minus six with snow for Thunder Bay, sunny and 11 below in Sioux Lookout. Minus 26 in Cloudy for Churchill, 17 below in God's Lake. Minus 13 in Winnipeg, 12 below in Dauphin. Minus 11 in Regina and Saskatoon, 
minus 7 in North Battleford. 10 below in Meadow Lake, snow, and minus 12 for LaRange. Over in Northern Alberta, minus 8 with snow in Fort McMurray. 3 below in snow in Grand Prairie. Minus 5 with flurries in Edmonton, plus 2 in Lethbridge. Plus 3 in Vancouver, 6 above in Victoria. Minus 4 with snow in Prince George, 0 in flurries for Smithers. Minus 25 in Old Crow, snow, and minus 5 in Whitehorse. Minus 12 with snow in Yellowknife, 15 below in Norman Wells. Minus 28 for Saks Harbor, 25 below in Politech. Minus 31 in Baker Lake, 29 below in Chesterfield. Minus 33 with snow in Resolute, 34 below in Arctic Bay. A cute story now about three kids in Saskatchewan trying to recover from a mishap with an electric shaver and an overzealous barber. Leah Tarangjo from the Cody First Nation just north of Camp Sac, Saskatchewan took this video of her nieces and nephew recovering from haircuts okay, doled out by Feda, the four-year-old. Three-year-old Judy escaped okay, but four-year-old Storm will have to wait a while to grow his hair out. The video has since gone viral on social media with comments from as far away as the United Kingdom. Why did you cut Who hair? used this, Veda? Huh? Oh my goodness, I could just cry. Who did my hair? Did my hair. Huh? Who cut my hair? Who cut your hair? Did you cut their hair? Why did you cut their hair? Huh? Why did you don't don't pull your shorts up? Why did you cut their hair? And look at your hair. Did you do that? Did you do that to your hair? Who did? Who did? Who did that to your hair? Doesn't look that bad. It'll grow back. Well, over the next two weeks, award-winning actress, producer, and former politician, Tina Keeper, will be our guest on Face to Face. We'll be discussing her time in politics and if she plans to run again, as well as her latest production and acting project, the comedy series Acting Good. Of course, we'll also be talking about the role that started it all for her on North of 60. Keeper says she never expected the series to leave the mark. It did. From my perspective, I thought Canada is not going to accept an, a, you know, a predominantly Native cast. A it's set in an, in an Indigenous community. This is, too, this is too foreign for Canadians. And I didn't think that it would, I didn't think it would last more than one season. And um, so we were all really surprised by its, yeah, just how well it did. You can watch our interview with Tina Keeper right here in about a minute's time. Part two of our interview will air next week on Face to Face. Also, be sure to join us tomorrow live at 3 p.m. Eastern time for In Focus. We'll be looking at Indigenous firsts and I'll sit down with an astronaut, a forensic pathologist, and Governor General Mary Simon. That's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For much more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca. I'm Dennis Ward. We'll see you back here tomorrow.